When the man and the old man started bringing things out of the house, the dog couldn't imagine what had got into them. Bedsteads, mattresses, chairs, tables, kitchen utensils, tools, boxes of this and that, all out on the grass where they would get rained on. The old man said, Are you sure you want to get rid of this nice set of encyclopedia? If you want it, put it in the car, Dad, Clarence said. The farmyard began to fill up with people, and he shut her up in the woodshed, though she wasn't meaning to do anything unless called upon. All she could see was the light that came through the cracks between the boards, but she could hear perfectly. More and more buggies and wagons kept arriving, and a person with a very loud voice kept shouting, walla, 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 and pounding on a table with a wooden mallet in such a way that it hurt her ears. And the animals seemed to be leaving. First the cows that she had the privilege of rounding up every evening of her life. And then the sheep. She could hear them baaing with fright. Then the hogs. Then the chickens and turkeys. And finally the horses, which was too much. How was the man going to plow without them? It must be the work of the loud voice. And if the man had only opened the door of the woodshed, the dog would have helped him drive that person clean off the property. To remind him that she was there, able and willing, she barked and barked. When he finally did let her out, the shouting had stopped, and all the things that had been standing about on the grass were either gone or in somebody's buggy or wagon. And the few people who were left were going, and the sun was already down behind the hill. Clarence got a length of rope and tied the dog to a tree, which she didn't understand any more than she understood why he felt it was necessary to shut her up in the shed. Then he brought some more things out of the house. A suitcase, fishing poles, a flashlight, an axe, an umbrella, and put them in the car. The old man pointed to the doghouse, and Clarence said, That stays here. While his father waited in the car, Clarence walked through all the empty rooms one last time. Then he locked the kitchen door and put the key under the mat. I'm glad this day is over, he said, and taking a firm stance in front of the car radiator, he gave the crank half a dozen quick heaves and then ran around and climbed into the driver's seat. The roar of the engine diminished as he adjusted the spark. The old man saw the dog looking at them expectantly and said, What if that fellow doesn't come? He'll come, Clarence said. He told me it might be dark before he got here, but he promised me he'd come today. The borrowed Model T drove off down the lane and the dog was tied up with night coming on, with no lights in the house and no smoke going up the chimney. She waited a long, long time trying not to worry, trying to be good, trying to be especially good, and telling herself that they had only gone into town and were coming right back, even though it was perfectly obvious that this wasn't true, not the way they acted. Eventually, in spite of her, the howls broke out. Sitting on her haunches, with her muzzle raised to the night sky, she howled and howled. And it wasn't just the dog howling. It was all the dogs she was descended from, clear back to some wolf or other. She heard footsteps and was sure it was the boy. He had heard her howling and come from wherever it was he'd been all this time and was going to rescue her. It turned out to be the man's friend from over the way. He put his lantern on the ground and untied her and talked to her and stroked her ears and for a minute or two, everything was all right. But then she remembered how they didn't tell her to get in the car with him, but drove off without even a backward look, and she let out another despairing howl. Lloyd Wilson tried to get her to go home with him, but she couldn't. If she did that, who would be on hand here to guard the property? 
In a little while he was back with some scraps for her, which she swallowed so fast she didn't know afterwards what it was she'd eaten. He filled the bowl with water from the pump and left it by the door of her house. Then he called to her and whistled, but she wouldn't budge. Have it your own way, but I doubt if anybody's going to get a wink of sleep, he said cheerfully and went off into the darkness. She howled at intervals all night and set the other dogs in the neighborhood to barking. The next day, when the man's friend came to see how she was getting on, she went halfway to meet him, wagging her behind. The widow fed her, and the little boys put their arms around her and kissed her on the top of her head, and she felt some better. That night at supper, with the dog sitting beside his chair and listening as if the story was about her, Lord Wilson said, you never had to tell him anything. When he died, I swore I'd never have another. The dog raised her head suddenly. Then she got up and went to the door. A wagon or a cart had turned into the lane at her place. She whined softly, but nobody paid any attention until there were footsteps outside and she started barking. Be quiet, Trixie, Lord Wilson said, and pushed his chair back from the table. In the light from the open door, he saw a young man who looked as if he were about ready to start running. Name's Walker, he said. I'm your new neighbor. I told Mr. Smith I'd be here two days ago, but my wife took sick, and we had to put off coming. She's still in Mechanicsburg, where I left her. No thanks, that's very nice of you. On my way through town, I stopped and got something to eat at the cafe. You haven't seen anything of my dog, have you? Seeing the rope dangling from the tree, James Walker kept the dog tied up for the next two days, though he had been assured it wasn't necessary. But he also fed her and saw that her pan had water in it and talked to her sometimes. And when night came, there was a light in the kitchen window and the dog smelled wood smoke. Things could have been worse. From time to time, she wanted to howl and managed not to. The day after that, trucks came bringing cattle and hogs and farm machinery and furniture. That evening, the young man untied the rope and said, Come on, old girl. I need you to help me round up the cows. She understood what he said all right but she wasn't his old girl, and she lit off down the road as fast as lightning. Clarence spent much of the time in his room with the door closed. He had dark circles under his eyes. His clothes hung on him. When his mother called him, he came to the table, but throughout the meal he looked at his plate rather than at them, and they had to ask him two or three times before he understood that they wanted him to pass something. His mother tried to get him to see a doctor, but he wouldn't. There's nothing wrong with my health, he said, in such a way that she was afraid to pursue the matter. Cletus was sure that his father would come to see them on Christmas morning, bringing presents. Ice skates was what he wanted. A rifle would be even better, but you couldn't use it in town, and anyway, it would be too expensive. Wayne still believed in Santa Claus. On Christmas Eve, when they undressed, their empty stockings were hanging from the foot of the bed, and they saw by the street lamp that it was snowing. When they woke up in the morning, their stockings were full, and there were more presents waiting for them downstairs. Aunt Jenny had got out her best tablecloth and roasted a capon, and there was a small artificial Christmas tree in the center of the table. They ate till they were stuffed. When they pushed their chairs back, his mother started to clear the table, and Aunt Jenny said, Leave all that till we've had a chance to digest our dinner. Cletus still wasn't worried. His father had never not given them anything for Christmas. Wayne wanted to play old maid. As Cletus sorted out his cards, he listened for the sound of footsteps on the porch. 
After a while, Aunt Jenny got up and began to stir around in the kitchen. I find it very strange of your father not to make any effort about your Christmas, Fern Smith said. What she found even stranger was that Cletus didn't seem to care. Maybe it was a stage he was going through, but he seemed so indifferent these days about everything. The decorated tree on the courthouse lawn was much too large to go in any house. On Christmas Eve, people had sung carols around it, but now the square was deserted except for two men standing in front of the drugstore. One of them was a traveling salesman who hated Christmas. The other was Clarence. Though he was looking straight at the big Christmas tree, he didn't know it was there, or what day it was, or why the courthouse square was so deserted. I thought the world of him, he said to the traveling salesman, till he broke up my home. Once the dog thought she saw Wayne from a distance, but it turned out to be only another little boy who looked like him. People tried to catch her, but she didn't let them get that near. Her coat was dry, and her eyes were lackluster, and she was skin and bones. She lived on rabbits and other small animals, and an occasional chicken that got loose from the run. Finally, she ended up in town, where some children chased her and threw sticks at her, but she managed to get away from them. At night, she foraged in garbage cans. In the end, she found them. Clarence Smith's mother looked out of the window at the side yard and exclaimed, I declare, it looks like we've got company. From the way the man made over her, the dog thought she was going to be allowed to stay and that he would take her to where the boy was. She smiled ingratiatingly at the old woman who said, it's all right with me if you want to keep her here. But that wasn't what happened. In the condition she was in, Clarence couldn't bring himself to give her a beating. He took her back to the farm and said, I guess you'll have to keep her tied up for a little while. I don't know what's got into her. She's always been a good dog and never given me any trouble. Then he went around the place, looking in all the sheds and in the cow barn and the horse barn for something he'd forgotten or lost somewhere. And a few days later, he came back and did the same thing. The new man's woman came and more snow fell and the ground was white and the snow turned to ice and the dog slipped and slid when she tried to go anywhere. So she stayed in her house and slept. Sometimes she dreamed she was waiting at the mailbox for the boy to come riding up the road on his bicycle. Awake, she wasn't anybody's dog. When she felt like wandering, she waited until the new man wasn't looking and then slipped away. The new tenant couldn't get Trixie to stay on the place, Fern said to Cletus. So your father took her to the vets and had her put out with chloroform. You must forgive him. He isn't himself. She wasn't herself either or she would have kept this information from him, or at least broken it to him more gently. Her letters to Lloyd Wilson were now almost entirely taken up with her fears about Clarence. The lawyer who had successfully steered Fern through the divorce proceedings twiddled his thumbs thoughtfully. Then, leaning back in his chair, he said, Did Smith actually say in so many words he was going to shoot you? No, Lloyd Wilson said, but I know that he's got a gun, and from the way he is acting. The lawyer glanced at his desk calendar to see what his next appointment was. I dare say you have every reason to be alarmed, but unless you can provide a witness who's ready to swear that Smith threatened to take your life, I doubt if the sheriff's office will consider that there are sufficient grounds to issue a warrant for his arrest. Suppose you keep in touch with me, and if there's any change in the situation.
Chapter 9, The Graduating Class When I go home, usually because of a funeral, I always end up walking down Ninth Street. I give way to it as if it was a sexual temptation. The house we lived in has changed hands several times, and some fairly recent owner sheared off the whole back part, the pantry, the back stairs, the kitchen, the laundry, where the cook stove was, and that upstairs bedroom where the Halloween party took place. Why? To save fuel? The porch railings and the trellises are gone, and so is the low iron fence that separated the front yard from the sidewalk. The high curbing and the two cement hitching posts are still there, having outlived their purpose by half a century. The elm blight killed off the two big trees I played under, and in their place are some storm-damaged maples so oddly placed that they must have been planted by the birds. In the backyard, where the flower garden used to be, there is a structure about the size and shape of a garage, but with a curtained picture window. Somebody must live in it. The house next door went up in smoke and flames one night, 10 or 15 years ago, defective wiring. And where it stood, there is a two-story apartment house that covers half of what used to be our side yard. Here and there, all over town, Big old houses are missing, or between two old houses that have survived, somebody has inserted a new house, spoiling my recollection of things. When I come upon the new hospital, I totally lose my bearings. Where exactly was the little grocery store my mother used to send me to when she discovered she was out of rice or butter or baking soda? And which wing of the hospital has obliterated the huge bed of violets in the backyard of the house where old Mrs. Hart lived with her son Dave, who never married. And was the bed of violets huge only because the child, who once a year knocked on the back door and asked for permission to pick them, was so small? When I dream about Lincoln, it is always the way it was in my childhood. Or rather, I dream that it is that way, for the geography has been tampered with and is half real half a rearrangement of my sleeping mind. For example, the small red brick house where Miss Lena Moose and Miss Lucy Sheffield lived. It was probably built during the administration of General Ulysses S. Grant and must have had dark woodwork and heavy curtains shutting out the light. When I dream about it, the proportions are so satisfying to the eye and the room is so bright, so charming and full of character that I feel I must somehow give up my present life and go live in that house, that nothing else will make me happy. Or I dream that I am standing in front of a house on 8th Street, a big white house with a corner bay window and carpenter's lace and scalloped siding. I have been brought to a stop there on the sidewalk by the realization that my mother is inside. If I ring the doorbell, she will come and let me in, or somebody will, and I will go through the house until I find her. But what is she doing there when it is not our house? It doesn't even look like our house. It was built in the 1890s, and our house is much older than that. And anyway, it's on Ninth Street. In order to deal with this riddle, I let my mind wander up 8th Street, beginning at the corner where the streetcars turn and go downtown. And before I get to the house I was dreaming about, I realize there is no such house, and I am abruptly awake. After six months of lying on an analyst couch, this too was a long time ago, I relived that nightly pacing with my arm around my father's waist, from the living room into the front hall, then turning past the grandfather clock and on into the library, and from the library into the living room, from the library into the dining room where my mother lay in her coffin. Together, we stood looking down at her. 
I meant to say to the fatherly man who was not my father, the elderly Viennese, another exile, with thick glasses and a Germanic accent, I meant to say I couldn't bear it. But what came out of my mouth was, I can't bear it. This statement was followed by a flood of tears such as I hadn't ever known before, not even in my childhood. I got up from the leather couch, and I somehow knew with his permission, left his office and the building and walked down 6th Avenue to my office. New York City is a place where one can weep on the sidewalk in perfect privacy. Other children could have borne it, have borne it. My older brother did, somehow. I couldn't. In the palace at 4 a.m., you walk from one room to the next by going through the walls. You don't need to use the doorways. There is a door, but it is standing open permanently. If you were to walk through it and didn't like what was on the other side, you could turn and come back to the place you started from. What is done can be undone. It is there that I find Cletus Smith. The little house opposite the fairgrounds looks as if there's nobody there, as if they have gone away on a trip somewhere. Aunt Jenny has pulled the shades to the sill. That way, people won't peer in and see what she sees whenever she closes her eyes, and sometimes when they are wide open. The double bed in the front room is made up, and Cletus is lying on it, with his shoes extending over the side so they won't dirty the spread. He is lying on his left side in the fetal position, as if he is trying to get out of this world by the way he came into it. The house smells of coffee percolating and then of bacon frying. He does not answer when she tells him breakfast is ready, and neither does he come. Sitting at the kitchen table, she blows on her coffee, but it is still too hot to drink, so she pours some of it into her saucer. It is time to let go of all these people, and yet I find it difficult. It almost seems that the witness cannot be excused until they are through testifying. Aunt Jenny gets up suddenly and goes into the next room and puts her hand on Cletus's forehead. He has no fever, but his skin feels clammy and he is very pale. His eyes are open, but he doesn't look at her. As she takes her hand away, he says, Would you be afraid if he came here? If who came here? He doesn't enlighten her, and after a moment she says, yes, she would. Where do you think he is? I haven't the least iota. Her hand is not steady enough to drink from the saucer, and so she pours the coffee back into the cup and forgets to drink it. The clock ticks louder at some times than at others. She stops hearing it entirely and hears instead the sound of her own heavy breathing. Quarter of nine comes and she clears her throat and says, Time you left for school, you'll be late. He is already late. The clock is five minutes slow, which she knows but has for the moment forgotten. His books are on a chair by the door, but he knows even if she doesn't that he can never go to that school again. He walks in the palace at 4 a.m. in that strange blue light with his arms outstretched like an acrobat on the high wire and with no net to catch him if he falls. The meeting in the school corridor a year and a half later, I keep reliving in my mind as if I were going through a series of reincarnations that end up each time in the same failure. I saw that he recognized me, and there was no use in my hoping that I would seem not to have recognized him, 
because I could feel the expression of surprise on my face. He didn't speak. I didn't speak. We just kept on walking. I remember thinking afterward, when enough time has passed, he will know that I haven't told anybody. But I still went on worrying, for fear he would think that the reason I didn't speak to him was that I didn't want to know him after what happened. Which is, I'm afraid, what he did think. What else? Did he go home and tell his mother? And did they then pack up and move to another part of Chicago to get away from me? If I'd had the presence of mind to say, you don't have to worry, I won't tell anybody, would they have been able to stay where they were? Would his mother have trusted a 15-year-old boy to keep such a promise, even if I'd made it? Sometimes I almost remember passing him in the school corridors afterward, and I think, though I am not at all sure of this, that I can remember being happy that I was keeping his secret, which must mean that he was there, that we continued to pass each other in the halls, that he didn't move away. But if he had stayed on at that school, sooner or later, we would have been in the same classroom, and I know that we weren't. Five or ten years have gone by without my thinking of Cletus at all, and then something reminds me of him, of how we played together on the scaffolding of that half-finished house. And suddenly, there he is, coming toward me in the corridor of that enormous high school, and I wince at the memory of how I didn't speak to him and try to put it out of my mind. One day last winter, plagued by guilt, I brought down from the attic a grocery carton stuffed with old papers, diplomas, newspaper clippings, letters from college friends I haven't seen for 30 or 40 years, and so on, and went through it until I found my high school yearbook. The photographs of the graduating class are arranged in vertical panels, 15 oval likenesses to a page. Cletus ought to have been between Beulah Grace Smith and Sophie Sopkin, and he isn't. If he had been, I would, I think, have been able to put him out of my mind forever. I went through the yearbook carefully, from cover to cover, looking for him. He isn't in any group picture or on any list of names. There is a limit, surely, to what one can demand of one's adolescent self. And to go on feeling guilty about something that happened so long ago is hardly reasonable. I do feel guilty, even so, a little, and always will, perhaps, whenever I think about him. But it isn't only my failure that I think about. I also wonder about him, about what happened to him. Whether he was spared the sight of his father's drowned body. Whether, after a while, he and his mother were able to look at each other without embarrassment. Whether he had as lonely a time as I did when he first moved to Chicago. And whether the series of events that started with the murder of Lloyd Wilson, whether all that finally began to seem less real, more like something he dreamed. So that instead of being stuck there, he could go on and by the grace of God lead his own life, undestroyed by what was not his doing. to So Long, See You Tomorrow, William Maxwell's books include All the Days and Nights, The Collected Stories of William Maxwell, The Chateau, Ancestors, The Folded Leaf, Time Will Darken It, and They Came Like Swallows. These are all available in vintage paperback. The Outermost Dream, a collection of essay reviews that he wrote for The New Yorker, 
is available from Grey Wolf Press. The American Audio Prose Library is a comprehensive collection of distinguished writers reading and discussing their work. Other writers in this series include Eric Bogosian, Laura Hendry, Larry Brown, Robert Stone, E.L. Doctorow, Alice Monroe, Elizabeth Spencer, Raymond Carver, Annie Dillard, Tony Morrison, and more than 100 others. For a free catalog of complete listings, write us, the American Audio Prose Library, at the address printed on the label of this recording. Or give us a call, toll-free, at 1-800-447-2275. This recording was produced for the American Audio Prose Library by Kay Benetti and Sam Stowers, with special assistance and thanks to the staff of the Fales Library at New York University. Sound recordist was Charles Potter. The music is performed by Bob Milne, a pianist specializing in turn-of-the-century American piano styles. He's available for lectures and performances and can be contacted by fax or phone at 1-800-701-5024. Partial funding for this project is provided by the Missouri Arts Council and by the Foundation for Contemporary Performance Arts. For the American Audio Prose Library, this is Kay Benetti. <laughs>